Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan. By the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment. And by gifts from friends of the program. Local broadcast is made possible in part by Pfizer. big title and 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 um, there are thousands tens of thousands maybe hundred uh, uh, thousand uh, uh, people working on this field this is an enormous field and will continue to be uh, enormous and and its, it's impact uh, is is of course very visible and and there will be other things we're gonna see um, within our lifetimes uh, uh, that, 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 that I want to talk about today. Now, now uh, as uh, Myron mentioned, uh, this is a follow-up talk. Um, so I'm going to uh, give uh, a review of what we have done so far. And, and, and one of the messages I had, I said uh, we focused on silicon, but there are many other semiconductors out there. And I will give examples, some of them from my research. And, and, and we're going to uh, focus on optical properties of semiconductors, which I did not mention at all in the previous lecture. So we're going to have uh, diodes and lasers. And in a material, gallium nitride, which I'm very passionate about. So I'm going to talk about gallium nitride. And, and, and if time permits, we're going to go back to silicon. So here is the review. So I basically mentioned that uh, materials are either insulators or conductors. And, and, and we did not understand why they were insulators or conductors even 50 years after Maxwell, where we, we knew everything about electricity and magnetism. Still, we didn't know why things were insulators or conductors. A picture em emerged after quantum mechanics where we realized that electrons in a solid live in bands. And, and not only that, if you have a completely filled band, turns out they are electrically, uh, uh, do not carry, carry any current. So, so, so when you look at uh, the bands and you fill electrons, and, and, and most of the time, you might have filled bands followed by empty bands, which would be an insulator, and semiconductors turns out to be insulators. And they are called semiconductors because band gaps are uh, an electron volt or so, which is such that you would get a few electrons in the conduction band uh, at finite temperatures and a little bit of uh, empty uh, uh, holes, so-called holes in the valence band, and those would carry current. And I made an analogy between water and, 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 and say semiconductor. Water, if it is a DI water, a pure water, is, is a reasonably good uh, insulator. But you add a little bit salt uh, into it, then you can make it into a, a conductor. And, 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 and the silicon was the semiconductor uh, that we focused on. So the, the equivalent thing to salt was, was, was called donor. So we, for example, phosphorus is like silicon, but has one extra electron. So, so, so if you put a little bit of uh, phosphorus, you get a conductor. I won't repeat these, but, but what we talked about the uh, invention of transistor, and, and, and the transistor that made most impact was a field effect transistor, a MOSFET. And, and basically today, for computer technology, we, we, we can take 12-inch uh, wafers of uh, silicon, and, and, and we can uh, basically print transistors, billions of transistors uh, on, uh, on, a, on, a, on a chip. And, 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 and this is where we are right now as far as that technology is concerned. Some of the highlights were the materials are very pure. The, 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 the gate width 
the size of the uh, transistor, the, 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 where the electrons have to travel, is about 65 nanometers, can be much shorter. And, and the most impressive numbers were, were these, I would say. They cost almost nothing, and we make a lot of them, OK? Now, uh, now, now, if you are in the business of computers, there is no uh, upper bound for demand. People want more transistors. They want more. They want more. And, 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 and coming up with an alternative technology is awfully difficult. Okay, But there are many other applications out there that you do not need billion transistors. Okay, uh, you know if you if you if you, if you the, the, the the earlier applications were radio, telephone, this that, you know you open your radio. They, there aren't billion transistors. There doesn't have to be billion transistors. Your cell phone doesn't have to have billion transistors. It can, but it doesn't have to. So 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 in applications where you do not need the computer, silicon is not a special material. There are a lot of other semiconductors that can do the job. Now, if you want to look at performance of a transistor, for example, the noise, the, the frequency that it can operate, those things are related to the material parameters of the semiconductor. And if you compare them, for example, gallium nitride, which I will talk uh, a bit more later, in, in many ways is a better material. It's, it's much more difficult to make. It's, it's not cheap. It is not cheap. And, 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 and the transistor, the underlying transistor, is not that different from the MOSFET. They have other names, like a high electron mobility transistor. But at the end, it is the same transistor. You have a source and drain. Basically, electrons live right here. And it's, it's like a switch. You can turn it on and off by, by a third terminal. So, 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 so in situations where uh, the application is demanding. For example, you're going to send something to space. So money is not an issue. You know, you, you, a few, few cents here and there is not a big deal. So what you want, you want the best transistor. If you're going to put a solar cell in the, uh, up in the space station, you want the highest efficiency. And, and in applications that you do not see, which is not visible to you, there are these other semiconductors people use all the time. Now, now, in addition to uh, the MOSFET or the high electron mobility transistors, there are many other exotic transistors out there. The transistors that, 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 that are developed, OK, or people constantly develop, most of them are developed in a, in a university or an, a, re, a research environment. Most of them do not make it to real life. This particular transistor, which I'm uh, proud of, I was, uh, did it as a part of my PhD thesis. It is, uh, I called it surface resonant tunneling transistor, which was a highly sophisticated transistor. I don't think anyone used it at all. And, and, and I don't have, we didn't even patent it, because we knew it was so hard to make that it, 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 it is not going to be used. But it's, it was a fascinating transistor. It, 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 it has a three terminal. But you had to go through, uh, the electrons had to go through a very uh, small one-dimensional wire, which had levels, uh, quantized levels. So you had to tunnel in and out. The, 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 the width of the device had to be engineered with atomic precision. So, so this had to have like uh, 20 atoms wide or so. And, and it had to have atomic precision not in one direction, but in two directions. And, and it worked. It, 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 it worked. It, 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 we showed, we wrote papers that we can do uh, multi-level logic with it because, because of uh, various reasons. But, but it's not going to be used most likely because, because it is not compare. You cannot compete with, 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 with the silicon technology if you are in the business of making billion, billion uh, transistors. There are other transistors. This is not uh, 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 the, the only one. This is actually something from Michigan. 
that uh, uh, we use called a single electron transistor, um, which is again, most likely will never be used in, in, in a real computer application. However, it's a fascinating transistor. It, is, it can be made from lots of materials. Uh, this particular one was aluminum on a uh, gallium arsenide uh, device and had tunnel junctions where, where the electrons had to tunnel in and out of an island which we could control by, by, by a gate. And the fascinating thing was, uh, was, was it works uh, by putting one electron at a time. So you can turn it on and off uh, with a single electron. So it has a, a, a enormous sensitivity to charge, so it's a, attractive to physicists. And, and they can use it, but, but, but absolutely not useful in real life. Uh, I didn't mention, but this transistor works at millikelvin temperatures, which, is, which doesn't exist on Earth, of course, so you have to go to uh, extreme conditions. These are um, thousand, in absolute scale, thousand times colder than room temperature or so. So, so there are many transistors and, and, and if you go to a conference, you know, chances are you would hear a new transistor by another graduate student on a new material. But, but at the end, most of the things that do work are actually the simple ones. So I'm gonna, this was a device we talked about. This is the two terminal device, just a PN junction. And, 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 and this was actually uh, the oldest semiconductor device that exists. Uh, it, it was even ex in existence uh, in the 20th. Now, 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 I'm gonna look at this device now from the optical uh, perspective. So the device was basically two materials. One type is P, the other is N, meaning that if it is, if it is a semiconductor, one type has impurities with extra electron, that's N type, and the other side has impurities with, with less, uh, you know, missing electrons, so those are the P type. And, 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 and equilibrium, you would get uh, basically these bubbles, holes on one side and, and electrons on the other side. And depending on the direction of the voltage you apply, you might either get current or no current because if you apply voltage, uh, there is a, uh, if you focus on say electrons, there is a barrier for electrons to go to the other side and if you apply one bias voltage, turns out you can make that barrier even larger and then the electrons would never leave the n-type material. But if you apply the forward biases, if you apply a bias voltage in the other polarity, you can decrease the barrier so now the electrons can go to the other part, but turns out that other part is where holes live and they recombine, they, they, these things sort of, uh, the holes are positively charged, electrons are negatively charged, they live in different regions, but if you put them together, they recombine, and in certain semiconductors, they can, uh, they, when they recombine, uh, they, they, they generate light. <coughs> In this particular configuration, it can be used as a detector, which unfortunately, there's a lot of stuff I, I won't mention about uh, detectors at all today. Now, now, they recombine, but if you wanna look at the recombination in detail, turns out in certain semiconductors, the recombination is, is, is such that when it happens, you get light. These materials are called direct band gap materials. Unfortunately, silicon is not one of them. This is, uh, uh, the, the, when we do the quantum mechanical description of the thing, I sort of said uh, energies and band, but if you wanna look at it in more detail, one should look at not just energy, but also uh, momentum or crystal momentum. And turns out, when you put electrons, electrons which are, which are uh, added end up right at the energetic, the most favorable place right here. And the bubbles, the holes, end up right here. In, in, in certain semiconductors, these things are aligned. And when they are aligned, they can recombine and, 
And, and for each electron, you would get one photon. You would get light out of it. In many other semiconductors, the band uh, uh, calculations or measurements tell us that the alignment are such that where the electrons end up are not in momentum space, are not uh, at the same place as the uh, holes. And in these situations, unfortunately, uh, uh, conservation of momentum does not allow that transition. So you would not get light out of this. So, so, so in silicon, the diode, which, uh, uh, which one can make, optically speaking, cannot be used to get light. But drag band gap semiconductors, you can. And diode is a simple, very simple device. I do have, uh, I do have it here. I'm going to turn on the voltage. There are different colored diodes uh, in this one, but I want you to focus on the red one. Um, you've probably seen these things. It's a, it's a simple two-terminal device. You turn it on, you get light out, out of it. <laughs> um, and, and the color of the light that is coming out is related to the material that is used. So, so, so the material, so you have electrons and holes, and, and the energy between them uh, is, is given by the material parameters. The light that is coming out, the energy of the light is, is the energy of the uh, band gap of the material. Now, this was apparently uh, was a cool thing in the, in the 70s. Uh, 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 I, I heard stories from uh, Bell Labs early days where uh, they would make uh, tie pins or things like that, just sort of with an LED, or, or they would put it on a telephone for, for no purpose at all, just because it was cool. It was just a red light. And it's cheap, it no, no, doesn't consume energy. Why not? Just sort of. And, 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 and the story is apparently, there was one story I heard where uh, there were Japanese visitors and they gave them all these gifts uh, and, then, and then the claim is the Japanese went and opened them and then did uh, analysis, tried to figure out what was in them. We'll come back to that later. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, now, now, if you can make LED, light emitting diode, you can also, the, 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 the one step farther is you can make something called a laser, which is a much more demanding device. And, 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 and the difference, actually, this is a laser, so I don't need to, uh, so, 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 so the difference is in the laser, all the light that is coming out is, is coherent. They, 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 they are not just only uh, same energy, but same uh, phase. And it is technically much more difficult to make it because you have to, uh, um, these, you can generate these electrons and holes, but that's not sufficient to make a laser. You have to have one mode win at the end. One, uh, and, and you need to uh, uh, have something called population inversion and also need a cavity to confine the light. But, 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 but it was successful in the early 70s, uh, and, 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 and with, with very limited equipment, actually, with, with, with very limited, uh, Russians actually succeeded uh, making lasers. Now, when I was in graduate school, Everyone that worked on semiconductors or semiconductors uh, other than silicon had, a, had this particular uh, diagram, either in their notebooks or, or taped uh, somewhere on the wall. Now, what this is, it tells us, because I said, if you take a semiconductor like gallium arsenide, uh, you know, there are many of them. Um, basically, the parameters are not given by you. You know, the nature tells you what the band gap is. So, so for example, gallium arsenide, 
the, 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 the band gap is about 1.45 eV, and this is the lattice constant. The lattice constant, they all are similar. If you look at the position of the atoms, they are all similar, except uh, some of them are bigger, fatter than the others. They are all similar. Some of them are fatter than the others. So, 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 so this is what nature gives us. So we just plot them. You know, here is gallium arsenide. Here is aluminum arsenide, and and the dashed lines is is a reminder that some of them are indirect band gap semiconductors, meaning that those are no good for 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 light applications, and the solid ones are all good. Of course, we also knew that if you have gallium arsenide and indium arsenide, you can mix them. And if you mix them, you can make their properties in a way, you know, in between gallium arsenide and indium arsenide. And so you can cover some range. So this was a very popular plot when I was in graduate school. Everyone ha ha had one. <laughs> now, now, in that graph, I'm not going to go back, but I, maybe I will go back. There is one uh, thing, uh, 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 there is a coincidence which is very exciting. Gallium arsenide and aluminum arsenide happens to have more or less exact the same lattice constant. That's what the nature gave us. And they are electrically very difficult, different. One have them large band gap, indirect, the other is direct, and a low band gap. Now, now, this was very exciting, it excited a lot of people. And the person I want to emphasize is, is, is uh, 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 Asaki, who was actually uh, in the 70s, he was a well-known person. He, he worked on uh, uh, a tunnel diode uh, and, and got Nobel Prize for it, a uh, uh, Zener tunnel diode. And, 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 and he uh, uh, started a research program in, uh, at IBM in the early 70s. He recognized the potential of this material system, gallium arsenide and aluminum arsenide. He recognized that if you put them on top of each other, since they have exact the same lattice constant, you can put them on top of each other without disorder. And remember from silicon disorder, we are talking about, we are not like chemists. 1%, even 0.001% is unacceptable. We want high quality materials for semiconductors. So, so you have to have lattice match materials. And, 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 and this was passable in this material system because they had identical lattice constant. His idea was the following. It's a very simple idea. So if you put one on top of each other, you can put many of them. Then, then if you look at what the electron sees, electron sees a periodic structure. It's like a lattice. It's, it's similar to what an electron sees in solid, but, 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 but at a longer length scale. It's, a, it's kind of engineered in a way. So, so his, his idea was if I make super lattices, you know, aluminum arsenide, gallium arsenide, electrically they are very different. You would get, normally in a material you would get bands, now you would get mini bands which can be engineered. And, 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 and the idea was why be limited by what nature gives us? Can we make our own materials? For example, you need a material with a band gap of 0.1 eV. Let's say you don't have access to such a material, Asaki said, let's go make it. And, and uh, so, 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 so this research effort, uh, uh, I would say, um, uh, was, was very ambitious. They had a, a very specific device in mind, which they didn't succeed, unfortunately. They wanted to do something called a block oscillator which turns out, uh, uh, you know, if you, ha if you have an electron, uh, this is only in quantum mechanical description, if you have an electron in, 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 in a band, what happens is if you apply electric field, the electron would accelerate, accelerate, and then, and then, and, and, and then the band is not, uh, it has finite width, so it would go back and, uh, and come back to the same place in the momentum space. So, so, so the prediction was, from the 20s, uh, was, 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 was if you apply DC voltage to a 
to a periodic structure, you would get AC oscillations, which are called block oscillations. He was after that, which, which, which failed. Uh, um, but nevertheless, this, is, this was a beautiful idea. Now, now, unlike silicon, gallium arsenide, all these other semiconductors are not made in, in, in big quantities. Okay, they are not made in, they are not like printing. You don't make, you know, a billion transistors on a chip. That's because, because that's not your business. That's your, you, you go after applications where one device uh, is significant. And, and you use something these days, you use uh, ultra high vacuum chambers that are called molecular beam epitaxy systems. There are other uh, yeah, systems. And, and in this one, what you would have, you would have maybe a three inch, four inch wafer, not, not, not the size silicon people use. And, and then you would have sources, gallium, aluminum, whatever you wanna grow, you would, you would bring them to your uh, material precisely, and you can make, grow these materials layer by layer. You can say, I want seven monolayers of aluminum arsenide, followed by too many monolayers of gallium arsenide, followed by five monolayers of aluminum gallium arsenide with an aluminum composition of 40%. Just go on and on. Write it on a piece of napkin. You can do it. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely, it's, it's, it's a, 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 a here is an example. This is a TM image of a so-called a quantum well. And, and, and in this particular one, you had one, two, three layers of material, a sandwich in between uh, a, a, another material. And, 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 and these are uh, basically, these are lattice match. So these are uh, high quality crystalline uh, materials. And, and, and so what you can do, you can engineer what the electron sees. Now, it was 1994, I was in graduate school, and we, we knew three, five semiconductors were successful and everything, but, but this device nailed it down. This is like, you know, I, I felt like, okay, so Mr. Asaki succeeded. This is, this is uh, as, as I mentioned uh, to you, the most demanding device is not the transistor, it's not the light emitting diode, but it's the laser, okay? And, and this was a laser which, which, which is called quantum cascade laser uh, developed by Frederico Capasso uh, and his group as uh, Bell Labs, which basically purely relied on gallium arsenide, aluminum arsenide system, and, and every property of what the electron sees were engineered. This is not something the nature gave us basically uh, uh, where the electrons live, what energies they live, uh, where they go, everything was engineered and calculated. So, 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 so this dream of Esaki that you can engineer everything, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, sort of this nailed it down. There were many other, I mean, I, I skipped a lot of stuff. There were many other things happened. We made detectors, we made this, that, but this was the most demanding one. Now, now, I mentioned to you that the applications of these uh, three, five semiconductors are not visible to you. They exist, they are important, but they are not at your home. They are not visible to you. Now, one of the applications was, 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 uh, was, was information transfer. It can be a phone call, it can be, it can be uh, your data, your email. At the end of the day, what you do is when you click on your uh, send email or when you call the thing, the, 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 the thing gets converted into zeros and ones are sent over, uh, over a network which, which is not visible to you. Now, this network relies on something called an optical fiber. It's gonna, it's gonna have three, five devices, but also optical fiber in it. And the optical fiber is a very, actually we have it right here. It's just a piece of glass right there. And, and, and it is interesting 
that the person who invented it, the one that, that really worked, was a graduate, undergraduate student here at University of Michigan. He actually took a course, you know, electricity and magnetism, learned about something called total internal reflection. What it means is, is if you have uh, materials with different index of refraction, uh, light gets, uh, 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 can get totally reflected. And, 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 and he had a project. Uh, the project he was working on was was in the uh, medical school. He was going to uh, look at, uh, basically insert fibers to, like, to look at people's stomach. So he needed fibers that were 50 centimeters or so. And, and he was doing that. And he was getting terrible images. He would clean his fibers, uh, repeat it again. They would give terrible images. And the reason is they get dirty. And when you have a dirty uh, fiber, uh, the, the, the total internal reflection does not happen properly. So what he had, and he talks to his physics professors here at the U of M, he says, let's make, basically, uh, in chemistry, we have different types of glasses with different indexes of refraction. So let's get a material with a large index of refraction and then cover it with an other uh, tube with a, with, a, with a lower index of refraction and let me melt it and make a fiber. And if I do that, then you would get light uh, uh, go uh, get reflected at this interface. So if you if you if you make put dirt on here, you scratch it, you step on it, you you spit on it, nothing would happen. So that was his idea. And 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 doing what an uh, undergraduate should do comes and talks to his faculty, and and they say absolutely not, don't do it. It is going to crack. This is a terrible idea. <laughs> so Christmas time. He does it <laughs> and, and, and makes the fiber go around this, uh, you know, makes 50 feet or so. And then uh, he has an oatmeal box, puts it around an oatmeal uh, box. <laughs> and it works. It works beautifully, OK? This, I would say, one of the biggest inventions of the century. And it's done by Larry Curtis, who's we have a student here. He was your age, and you know, they're taking a course. Uh, <clears throat> I actually, whenever I teach a course to my students, I always show, uh, show this example because you don't have to think, uh, you know, the, 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 the big impact things doesn't have to be uh, 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 huge inventions. You know, it's, it's simple things are. Now, now what this is good for. Uh, is, is, is you can uh, uh, transmit light. Uh, now, now, I want to show you uh, 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 a couple demos. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the thing like a phone company. Okay? So, so, so let's say you are in the business of transmitting uh, sound. So I'm going to uh, basically uh, uh, have an oscillator here, and I'm going to turn it on. What, what I'm doing is, is I'm changing the frequency. And so this is an oscillating voltage. And, and this is a speaker. What the speaker does is it, you, you apply electrical voltage. So it moves back and forth. And it moves back and forth. I generate sound, and you're going to hear that. I'm going to increase the frequency, and, and, and the, the, the sound will change. Okay. And, and right now, it's around 60 hertz. You probably hear it if you're in the front. You hear it? It's about 100 hertz, so it moves 100 times a second. 200, 400. This is one kilohertz, goes back and forth 1,000 times. Three kilohertz. 6 kilohertz, 12 kilohertz. Can everyone hear? <laughs> All right, now we are at 16 kilohertz. Chances are, if you're young, you might actually, but, but I can't. So, so that is sound. So sound, you know, if you want to think about information, you know, when I talk, the, the, the thing you need to record about, you know, 
10 kilohertz, meaning that maybe 10,000 things per second or so. Now, now you can take that sound and, and modulate a laser with it. It can be, in this one, it's gonna be a analog modulation. This one, let's say, let's leave it at this frequency. This is 500 hertz or so. And the laser is here. There is a light here, right there. The laser is here. And, 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 and it's, it's on, but it's modulated, you know, the signal goes up. It can be done uh, digitally as well. And, and, and now it goes through this thing and, and reaches something on the side. I'm sorry? Can you switch the other one over to? This one? Really? So sorry. <laughs> I can't hear it. That was 20 kilohertz. I'll just disconnect it. <laughs> All right. So now. How many times can you modulate the, uh, you know, how much? It turns out you can modulate it as, as uh, 40 gigahertz. Giga is, you know, that is uh, uh, 10 to the 9, 10. So we are talking about you can have million phone calls go through this laser, okay? Not just one, okay? I mean, the thing, the, the, and, and you see uh, in this particular application, um, which is not visible to you, the speed is extremely important. You want the best possible transistor. I actually met a person, I worked at uh, uh, Bell Labs briefly, who was, who was uh, basically making the laser diodes that were gonna be used in, in, uh, under the Atlantic, okay? So the laser diodes, to my surprise, he was doing it by hand. He was, he, he, and remember, uh, he doesn't need a lot of them. Turns out these things can, the, the, the laser, uh, uh, the, the, the fiber is so clean right now, you can transmit the uh, signal 50 kilometers or so, uh, and, and the detector can detect on the other end. And, and if you're talking about 500, uh, uh, 5,000 kilometers, you know, Atlantic, you're talking about 100 or so lasers. And, and these things are tiny. You can pick it up with a tweezer. So the whole thing was, 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 was on a Petri dish. You know, he, he has to take them, test them one by one. Absolutely stressful job. I, I felt so bad for this person. I mean, because if, if, it is, if one of them goes wrong, they literally have to take the ship back and figure out which one it is, take the cable out. It's a, but, 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 but it does, it does work. Now, here is another thing that really happened in graduate school that blew my mind and, 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 and a lot of my friends too. Now, remember that diagram I showed you? On that diagram, we, which we all had all these semiconductors, on that diagram, there is no gallium nitride. It's not listed. The band gap is such that, actually, it's not even this structure. It's a different structure. There isn't anything lattice match to it. So, 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 so there was absolutely no research on it, as far as I know, uh, in, the, in the 90s. Now, this gentleman is uh, Mr. Nakamura. He was an unknown scientist. He didn't even have a PhD. And, and he worked on this material apparently for 10 years and no one knew about it and his management totally discouraged him. Uh, and, 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 and he made something called a, a, a blue LED. I mean, why is blue? It's the same as this one, except the band gap of gallium nitride is larger. And, and, and there was no such 3-5 semiconductor that, that, that we had, so there was no blue LED on the market at the time. 
And, and, and he makes this material and he improves it. He doesn't write papers. And instead, we hear this company, Nichia, we heard one day, is selling blue LEDs, not making, not publishing, selling. <laughs> okay? They don't tell how they made it. What happened is people bought the LEDs, they opened it, they did exactly what you know, uh, they were preaching people shouldn't do. They, they, they tried to figure out what was in it. Now, now this, well, well, I'll tell you more. This person is now at uh, Santa Barbara. He actually got a bonus of about $170 from the company, <laughs> okay? And, and, and he sued the company. It was uh, sort of eventually they uh, agreed on 170 million, which I will, ex uh, uh, which I will uh, argue that is, that is really not a fair thing. He deserves much more than that. But then it was overruled, so, so he didn't get anything. And eventually they settled for $7 million for this invention. Now, now, when this happened, I was very excited, and I'll tell you why. I would. The, the first thing, and not just to me, I, uh, to, 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 to my friends as well, we knew that sooner or later, if you make an LED, you can make a laser, and indeed, they made it. The first application we saw was the following. If you look at a CD or your DVD, the information is stored on the surface. There, there are some patterns, and, and they are read by, by, by a laser. And if you, if, you, if you make the same thing and read it by a blue laser, blue laser has a wavelength which is about factor two smaller, then, then, then you can read finer features, which meant that it, 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 uh, we, we thought that uh, DVDs can go uh, in storage capacity by a factor of four or so. And indeed today, there are, they call it Blu-ray, uh, 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 same size DVDs that can record about factor five more than, 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 than the regular DVD. But there was something much more. See, blue, blue is so important because if you have blue, because we had the other colors. If you have blue, you can make any color. Because, see, so I'm gonna turn this one on and, 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 and you've probably seen things like this. Where, so we had the red, we had the green, we had the red and the green. Blue were missing. And if you can make blue, you can make white light. Okay, so, so, so that meant something much, much bigger because, because now this can get into something very mundane, you know, like, like it can maybe replace lights that are around us. Now, you've probably seen things like this. The first place, this was the easiest one for them to get in, uh, is, is in the auto industry because they have a battery, they want the lights to be uh, efficient, also with traffic lights. The, 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 this is already happening, okay? You, you see them all around. And, and they have practically infinite lifetime, okay? And, and, and if you look at the way the light is generated, it is intrinsically so much more efficient than anything else. For example, in this particular one, I have, uh, I guess, just three LEDs there. If I increase the voltage, the LEDs turn on at different voltages. So, so maybe you can see. Now they are all off. You see the red one started first, now the blue one, now the green one. And, and the reason is, you apply voltage, right? You have to apply sufficiently large voltage uh, related to the band gap of the material. And, and if you do it right, every electron you put, if it is a direct band gap semiconductor, you can get one photon out of it. Unlike the, the, the light bulb Mr. Edison invented, this is actually, you can go touch it, it's cold. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't waste much energy. And if you want green light, you have to have a larger band gap material, uh, uh, et cetera. 
So this is going to happen soon. This is coming. This is you're going to see. The, the tungsten lamp, which is, of course, more than 100 years old, is going to disappear. It puts about 15 lumens per watt. Lumens is a silly unit. Uh, it, it, it deals with the response of the eye. So, so it's, 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 uh, but nevertheless, this is the figure of merit. And, and, and the compact fluorescent lights are much more efficient. So, so, so you should use these instead of these. Uh, they, they, they are 60 lumens per watt. And, and if, if, if Al Gore were the president, chances are we would uh, be using more of these. They would be cold. Now, the LED uh, solid state lighting uh, things right now, the ones you can buy, if it is comparable uh, power, uh, around 50 lumens per watt. But, but individually, uh, people can achieve around 130. But when you look at the trend, it is very uh, soon they're going to reach 150 or 200 lumens per watt. Now, what does this mean? This is the, this is the image, not from one day. This is a combined image of Earth at night. And, and there is significant electrical uh, power is consumed by light bulbs. I would uh, think it's around 20% or so. And, and they were highly inefficient. They are highly inefficient. Now, you can convert these things to numbers in terms of dollars. If you say, if I get 150 lumens per watt instead of 15 lumens per watt, what are the savings? The, the numbers are in the uh, hundreds uh, of billions uh, range, dollars range. But the money doesn't capture it all. We have only one Earth. Okay, and, and the next talk, I believe, is going to be about uh, climate change. See, uh, the, the, the energy consumption, our energy consumption, has to go down for ethical reasons, you know, for, for the future of, of our kids. And, and it's going to come from many sources, but one of the sources will be, will be the gallium nitride-based uh, uh, lighting systems. Now, I mean, this is again a, a, a view graph from uh, one of uh, from a paper which is under review right now. Um, see, when I talk to my colleagues, I you know they ask, "What do you do?" I say, "Yeah, we you look at uh, threading dislocations in gallium nitride uh, grown on sapphire," and they say, "Oh, okay." You know. <laughs> So our goal is to reduce the threading list locations from 10 to the uh, 19 to 10 to the 18 or 10 to the 17 range. Remember, gallium nitride is not like silicon. It doesn't have a nice substrate. So, so you have to deal with disorder. These are highly disordered things. So we, 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 we explore different uh, methods of reducing these dislocations. We grow on pattern substrates. And, 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 and we are semi my successful, we, in some cases, we can reduce. But what it is at the end is if we reduce the thing, then the dislocations is in a way is related to the efficiency of the light sooner or later. Because light, if, if the material is pure, okay, light will recombine, electrons and holes will recombine, and then they will generate light. If there is disorder of any sort, Okay, that's an alternative way. That's a wasted power. So, so, so you can spin it around. I mean, of course, in the community we don't. When we talk to uh, other gallium nitride people, but everyone knows it. But, 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 uh, but for a general audience, it is important. If you, if you, if you look at it in the big picture, a small gain you have, okay, in reducing disorder will imply better lights, and in the global sense, the impact is enormous. Now I'm going to go back and talk about silicon a bit. See, I was of the opinion that this, 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 this technology of uh, producing 
billion transistors is there for forever, more or less, because it's so successful. We, will, we, we, we know how to make them very cheaply. Um, now, turns out, if you have an alternative technology, if you have an alternative transistor, this, that, and if you say, I'm gonna make a computer, most likely uh, you will not succeed in making billion times billion transistors. You can do it in lab. But, but that technology, that, that you know, silicon fabrication fabri technology, can be used for other things. Intel, in principle, can go do other things using that kind of technology. This is, this is a picture of gears, micro-machine gears, made uh, using silicon. This is the same process that they use. And when they say, I made, uh, you make one, they can actually make it on a chip. You can have many of them. This is, you know, uh, these things are 100 microns or so. Uh, they, can, they can even have micron size features. Of course, you might say, why are the uh, gears so important? Who will want uh, a motor that is, you know, uh, uh, rotating? Well, there are things you do want. I'll give an example. So this was, uh, this was a silicon thing, but had nothing to do with, with, with MOSFET or silicon or anything. This is a bunch of mirrors. Here, here is the thing. And, 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 and you can not only make uh, transistors, but you can make films, you can uh, uh, remove what's underneath, you can metallize it, you can make yeah, you can make mirrors and you can make them move. You can make them move electrically. And, 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 and this, you can make an array of them. And, and, and this particular one, in, the, in 2000, 2001, you wouldn't believe how hot this subject was uh, because, because they could make a, an optical switch. So optical switch is the backbone of the information uh, transfer industry and you have all these things coming together, you wanna uh, basically send the laser light from, from fiber seven to fiber 22, and, and you can do that by mirrors. This is not the only way, but you can make it with mirrors. Now, in the 90s, late 90s, there were predictions. They, 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 uh, some of them, turns out, were hyped, were wrong, but they were growing, they were showing growth of the internet use or the use of the uh, thing. Uh, they were doubling every six months, nine months. Uh, and, 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 and there was this feeling that, 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 that we had to do, we had to come up with new components. And, uh, and, 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 and some of these devices, uh, were hyped such that, I know not this one, this was hyped greatly too, there was another one uh, with a different technology. When the company announced the prototype, their stock went up by $47 billion, <laughs> okay? If you, if you, uh, uh, Myron is a high energy physicist, they make super colliders which do not cost $47 billion, mm -hmm. okay? So something that you can put it in your pocket, of course it was hyped, maybe it was hyped by a factor of 10, but still something that you can put in your pocket, can, can that be that valuable? And, 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 and it's, it's, it's a iffy question. But, but the point I wanna make is, is is, is the technology for, for silicon, okay, since we do have to make it at large scale, since the tools, the underlying thing is figured out, they can go on and make other things. Again, I'll give an example from my research. Um, this is, uh, there, is a, there is a wireless integrated microsystem centers at University of Michigan which has a lot of people uh, working on making something called a vapor sensor. Now this is at the end uh, will be made by uh, silicon, a lot of the things. Not because silicon is the material uh, uh, that is needed for this thing. Okay, it turns out that what you need is a, is a chemical <coughs> sensor 
and, and you need some plumbing, you need a long tube, okay? And you take, you know, if you want to analyze some unknown mixture of vapors, you take that mixture and then you vaporize it, you pass it through a long tube, you separate them, uh, and then you have a sensor you detect it. And this is called gas chromatography. It exists in chemistry labs that are this size, big equipments, you know. Works beautifully. But turns out everything in that, you know, all those mechanical things, which has nothing to do with electronics, they can be made in silicon. You can make pumps, you can make tubes, you can make, you can put the whole lab on a chip. Okay, so you can make many of them. Again, you might not, maybe you will see this. But, but, but I am involved, I do the sensor part, uh, uh, and, and this is, uh, when you see a nice picture like this one, it means, you know, uh, uh, that they, they are still working on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we are still working on it, it's, it's not a... Uh... So, so I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna conclude. I, uh, of course, silicon is exciting. <coughs> silicon is, uh, for, for, is gonna remain here for, for, for a long time. The, the technology they have is so superb that not only uh, they're gonna continue making computers and other things, they can also make, you know, things like a, a lab on a chip, they can, and, and these things can detect, they can, uh, that particular one is the equivalent of a nose in a way, you can smell things. And they can make, you know, if, if someone says, for example, 20 years later, or oh, this other uh, the company came and we, we are making totally different way of transistors, I would be awfully surprised. But if someone says the following, if they say, yeah, Intel, now decided to make uh, uh, chips that analyze urine, you know, so every time you flush, you know, it, it, it gives you your, you know, okay, so this is, this is you, you, you're getting sick. You know? I wouldn't be surprised, absolutely. It, it is, you know, it can be made, if it is silicon, it can be made chip, it can be made um, mass produce. But the other, on the other hand, Silicon is not the only semiconductor. There are many other semiconductors that are, that are, that, that, that are going to be used and exciting, okay? Uh, and, and those are for real. They might not be visible to you, okay? They might not be, a, a, a one MBE machine can actually supply probably enough lasers for, 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 for all the, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 transatlantic uh, communication system. You might not see them, but they are visible, I mean, they are significant. And uh, I think uh, I probably didn't do justice to the field. There are so many things I didn't talk about. I didn't talk about organic stuff because I don't know it. You know, <laughs> there, are, there are so many things I didn't talk about. And, 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 and so I, 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 you shouldn't get the feeling this is it, but, but this is just to give you a flavor of, of what's happening, what will happen. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan, by the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment, and by gifts from friends of the program. Local broadcast is made possible in part by Pfizer. Pfizer.